Hi, everybody. Um, I came to the very first SOCAP, I think it's like 13 years ago, I'm not sure how old this is, 12, 13 years ago, and stood on this stage, and I remember there were, you know, maybe 200 people at the whole thing, and I haven't been back since, and now there's thousands of people here, which is so, so awesome, so great, such a good sign for our world, uh, and it needs to be millions, it needs to be millions. Um, so I'm not an investment manager, I'm not a finance character like all of you are, um, uh, but I'm someone who's done a lot of work with people and money. And um, the book I wrote called The Soul of Money is really about my journey as a pro-activist. I call myself a pro-activist rather than an activist because I'm kind of rooted in what I'm for and not so much uh, in what I'm against although I see what's in, in the way, uh, and it's my um, uh, intention to stay rooted in what I'm for, uh, and then know that it, we need to hospice the natural death of the structures and systems that stand in the way of what we want, hospice them rather than try to kill them. Um, if, if we hospice them, and I know you're all working on this stuff, they'll die their natural death death faster and with more dignity because they did give us uh, some of the things we needed. But particularly these economic systems that we're all trapped in, uh, it's time to hospice their natural death while we midwife the birth of the structures and systems that you're all creating with your companies, with your investors, with your heart, with your soul. Um, but not being in your field so much the way you are, and I actually I don't know, but I can kind of guess, uh, I learned most of my lessons about money uh, as a pro-activist working on issues of hunger and poverty, empowering women and girls, uh, environmental issues, preserving the Amazon, and working with indigenous people. So a, a broad range of pro-activism. And a lot of my lessons came from people that um, I used to call poor. I actually thought they were. And I, I don't use that term any longer except in the beginning of talks to kind of establish this thing I want to say to you, that when we call people poor, um, it's such a diminishment of us uh, and them. Because they're not poor. In fact, they're some of the most creative. People living in those kinds of circumstances are some of the most creative, courageous, awesome people on this planet, and I think you probably know what I mean by that, because they're whole and complete people, and describing them as poor demeans them and demeans us, because what's poor is not them, but their circumstances, the circumstances they're living in. They're whole and complete. In fact, often more courageous than most of us are going to need in our whole lifetime. Just being innovative enough to feed their families. I'm thinking of women in Africa now that I've worked with over the years. Um, so this labeling we do uh, based on resources when in fact it's the circumstances people are living in rather than them. So these people are not poor. In fact, they're some of the most uh, strong, amazing, creative, and intelligent people that I've ever worked with. They may not know how to read or write, but that not, that's not because they're not intelligent, it's because they've never had that opportunity. So I learned a lot of lessons about money, and really about life, from people that I used to call poor, and I would never call them that any longer. And I hope you don't either. And then I've learned, because I'm uh, working in the, what's often called the non-profit sector, I don't call it that myself, I call it the social profit sector, because we're generating a massive profit, it's a social profit, as are you. I think we all want to be in the social profit sector and not be defined by whether or not we pay taxes. <laughs> you know, the kind of profit we want to generate at this conference. Yes, financial profit, that's good, but you want to generate a social profit. That's why this is called SOCAP. And I say that word profit can be spelled two ways, P-R-O-F-I-T or P-R-O-P-H-E-T. 
When I look out there at my friend Lori Meyercourt, she is a social prophet. She's standing for a future that does not yet exist, but she's living into it with her, the way she lives, the way she thinks, the way she uses her financial resources, the way she invests, and so are all of you. So as a person working in the social profit sector, uh, that is sometimes called a non-profit sector, but don't call it that anymore because that's making us the not sector or the not for sector. Uh, and I don't like working in the not sector. <laughs> uh, because actually when you think about it, uh, where we all care the most, uh, where we want the most for ourselves, for our future, for our children, for the natural world, for future generations, for the unborn, is in that kind of work, the work that creates a social profit rather than only a financial profit. So I've been fundraising all my life since I was five years old, and I'm a little older than that now. I've raised hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars. And I've also had, uh, when you do that, you have the opportunity, as you do as investors and investment managers and people running companies, to talk to many, many people that I used to call rich. And I realized that label is as debilitating as uh, the label poor, calling a person rich. Because they too, you too, all of us are whole and complete people living in the ebb and flow and sometimes tyranny of circumstances that change all the time, financial circumstances that change all the time. And when we label ourselves by our financial circumstances, it separates us, it's ha it has us not see the wholeness and completeness of each other, um, it has us relate to people inaccurately as if there's something less about them or more about them, uh, and uh, particularly when uh, speaking with people living in enormous wealth, uh, flooded with wealth, it seems so attractive, seems like what we all want. It's, as you know, probably many of you, uh, there's huge issues uh, with that, with living in that kind of condition. In fact, what it does is amplify much of the dysfunction uh, rather than resolve it. So um, that's been my journey with money. Um, and I've also now, working very deeply with indigenous people who never even knew there was such a thing as money. Indigenous people primarily in the sacred headwaters of the Amazon rainforest, the most biodiverse ecosystem on Earth, the ecosystem that, uh, that was like a Noah's Ark during the Ice Age, during the Pleistocene era, where millions and millions of species migrated uh, and uh, made it through that really difficult time on planet Earth. And this particular area of rainforest, about 100 million acres at the base of the Andes, regenerated, repopulated life after the Pleistocene era. And it's pristine and untouched. Uh, we, uh, at Pachamama Alliance, our organization, uh, aim to keep it that way by putting it in permanent protected status. Many of you have helped us with that. Um, and it can regenerate and repopulate the entire Amazon uh, as these other ecosystems, these raging fires, the horrible situation in Brazil is taking place. Uh, the indigenous people there know that if the sacred headwaters stays intact, and untouched, the Amazon can be, maybe not in their lifetime, but regenerated. So working with indigenous people who didn't know there was such a thing as money taught me a whole lot about money and how weird our relationship is with money. How distorted, how dysfunctional, how crazy, how screwed up, really, uh, ind individually and as an entire society. Because in order for them to maintain and sustain any contact with the outside world, we needed to explain to them about this thing called money, which they say you can't hunt for it, you can't eat it. Why does everybody want it? Uh, and they could tell in their encounters with the outside world how crazy people are about money, how addicted we are to money. And so those teachings about money our relationship with money, led me to really look into the soul of money, or our soul in our relationship with money, hence the book, the Institute, The Soul of Money. And I'll just say a couple things about what I've learned, um, and there's so much more I could say. Um, 
but money actually doesn't belong to us. I mean, really. <laughs> it belongs to all of us or none of us. It just moves around this planet. We invented it. We invented it, and now we're totally at the effect of it. And it moves around the wa this, uh, this planet much like water. If you think about water, now it's, we're just starting to privatize it, unfortunately, but when you just think about it outside of that, water's just moving around the planet, and when it flows, when it moves, it can purify, it can make things grow, it can nourish, it can cleanse, it can really make things gorgeous and beautiful. But when it's held, or hoarded, or stuck, it becomes stagnant and toxic to that entity, that person who's holding on to it. I'm talking about water now. Money is just like that. When we keep it moving, and we move it away from fear, and towards love, towards what we love, towards the highest good, which is, I think, what this whole conference is about, that's the source of true prosperity. So money is like water, that's why we call it a currency. Uh, it's a current. And right now, I'm just going to tell you that I think the most important thing that we can do with money is known, be known not for what we accumulate, but for what we allocate. Where we allocate it. Where we send it. And I, um, I want to share this Cherokee prophecy. I try to share everywhere I go, even if I just have a short talk to give, like today. Um, because women know a lot about water, and women know a lot about money. Um, in this flow way that I'm talking about, moving it towards the highest good. So the Cherokee prophecy says that the bird of humanity has two great wings, a male wing and a female wing. The male wing has been fully extended for centuries, but the female wing hasn't yet fully extended in any of us, men and women. So it's been truncated, it's been half-hearted, it hasn't fully expressed itself. While the male wing, in order to keep the bird of humanity afloat, has become overdeveloped, over-muscular, and in fact has become violent. So the bird of humanity, for centuries, has been flying in circles. And this is the century, the Cherokee people say, when the bird of humanity's female wing will fully extend, and the male wing will relax, and the bird of humanity will soar. I call this the Sophia century, the 21st century, when women will take their rightful role in co equal partnership with men and the world will come back into balance, but also the female, the feminine in all of us will become fully expressed. The male in, in all of us that maybe has gotten overdeveloped, overmuscular, and in fact aggressive and violent will begin to relax and the bird of humanity will soar. May we fly together into a new future, out of this conference, out of the work we're doing, out of our lives, uh, into a humanity that soars. Thank you.